at Maison Market de Men. We are proud to be the importers into the UK market of the lovely wines of uh, Severine Schwimberger and her family in Alsace. So just a couple of words of introduction to Severine. But before I do, I just explain that during the webinar, uh, you cannot ask direct questions, but you can on your screen on the Q&A section, uh, you can uh, type a question which will be picked up by Kate and I, and we'll put your question when we think is a good moment uh, to Severine. Uh, but in principle, we will have about half an hour of Severine talking about her wines, and then we will have uh, 10 or 15 minutes of questions at the end. So Severine, so exciting to have you here uh, online uh, with a lovely you view much. behind you of the, <laughs> of the vineyards. Severine, to introduce her, she is uh, the ambassador, if you like, for her family's wines around the world. And we are very lucky to see her in England quite frequently. And she is the seventh generation of her family, amazingly, still owning these wonderful vineyards. So I'll ask her now to start to explain a little bit about her family heritage and their very special place in Alsace, on the mountains of the Vosges. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Alsace. I'm uh, extremely pleased to be with you uh, today in, uh, in front of a brand new tasting room. Um, Alsace, uh, just a quick reminder, northeast of France, border of Germany and Switzerland. Uh, Domaine Schlombergie happens to be the largest privately owned estate in the region. Um, so domain, what does domain mean? Domain means uh, that is 100% estate. We don't buy grapes, we don't buy juice. All the wines are coming from our own production. Therefore, we look at ourselves more like fruit producers than winemakers. Exactly like cooking, when you want to make a good recipe, you need good ingredients. Um, it is the same with wine. Everything starts with the fruit. So I'm going to uh, show you um, quite a large pictures that I cannot carry with me of our estate. Um, so literally this is uh, the estate that don't even fit on the screen. So it's a very large hoarding of vineyard. Uh, 100 hectares out of the 130 on slopes. Which, uh, which is quite challenging to, um, to run through. So it's very, very steep, growing terraces uh, with 35 miles of stone walls. So quite an impressive um, area, uh, vineyard. Not only in Alsace, but impressive in general in France. I mean, it's unlikely to see vineyards um, of this type uh, in France. So the challenge is the size, of course, because with such a big estate, uh, you have to be pretty much everywhere at the same time to collect the fruit. The, this is why we have quite a large team uh, dedicated to the vineyard. Uh, they're doing uh, 35 people are in the vineyard all year long, uh, growing the best possible fruit. Alsace, I know, challenging. People are like, I'm not too sure. Everybody loves Alsace wines, but never think about opening it or ordering it in restaurants because they're not sure and so on. Uh, it's understanding. Alsace is the only region in the world to offer such a diversity of white wine. Going from an easy drinking Pinot Blanc to the most opulent late harvest, we have every single style of white wine you can think of. So it's a matter of pick and choose. Um, you really have to focus on what you desire. If you are more on white wine, we've got it, off dry, sweeter wines, it's absolutely sure that you will find a wine you like in Alsace. But you have to try. We agree with that. What we have done uh, at Schlombergie to make it, uh, I don't have it here, uh, a little bit easier is on the back label, you have a, a line to tell you how dry or sweet the wine is. What uh, Schlumberger is all about, mainly, mainly, uh, Schlumberger is about Grand Cru wines. Now, what does Grand Cru mean? 
Grand Cru is a specific piece of land that due to the soil characteristic, the exposure and the history is known to make higher quality wines. Like in your garden, when you know exactly where you're going to plant your tomatoes because they have more sun and the soil is better to them. It's the same with the wines. So we have four different Grand Cru, two very impressive wines, which is Kiteli going around like this, extremely steep, followed by the Kessler, the Sering being on the little island here, and the Spiegel, which is the smallest one of a four Grand Cru. So what difference do they have? Well, the entire land of a vineyard is pure sand. It's a very poor soil of sand. In the Kitali, you have volcanic rocks that brings extra minerality to the wines. Kessler and Spiegel both have a pure sandy soil and serving as limestone. So it's definitely four different terroirs that, believe it or not, will reflect in your glass uh, what we do at Schlumberger to make sure that those terroirs are going to be expressed into your glass, we wait that the plant is 15 years of age, use Grand Cru wines into Grand, Grand Cru grapes into Grand Cru wines. So between four and 15 years, Grand Cru grapes automatically are going into a classic range called Les Princes Abbé. Uh, so we have time that the, the plant go deep in the ground and feed itself with the terroir characteristic. So at Trombergé, at this stage, or in any occasion, you can try Riesling Sering, Riesling Kessler, Riesling Kitterli from the same vintage. And no matter how knowledgeable you are on wine, you can easily tell they're different. And the only difference in those wines are the terroir characteristic. Um, the lucky part of this as well is that all our Prince Abbe range benefits on every single vintage of 30% Grand Cru additions. So we managed to get a consistency in our line of a, in a range of wine year after year. And Severine, can I ask you, when, when you're um, uh, making Grand Cru wines, and this in Alsace, I think there are two classifications, is that right? Just Alsace or Alsace Grand Cru, is, is that right? For now, it's right. Uh, the premier yeah. appellation is coming, but it's not here yet. Yeah. And so what is the difference uh, in terms of your, your uh, requirement for Grand Cru as opposed to the other ones? Is it just the location or do you have uh, other reasons, uh, the yield or other, other controls? Yes. The location is a must. The geological... Uh, effect of the, the soil really is a, is a must. You cannot make Grand Cru if it, it doesn't come from the official Grand Cru appellation. Yields are also um, a must. Uh, for general wines, they allow 80 hectolitres per hectare. They only allow 55 hectolitres per hectare for Grand Cru. At Chlamberger, we are more on 35 hectolitres per hectare. And Kitali is even 25. So it's, it's a very uh, extra concentration, less grapes with more concentration. But why, um, why, Serene? Why do you get such a low yield? Uh, small is beautiful. <laughs> That's a <laughs> fact in life. So the less you have, the better it is. It's exactly, if you think of it, like, uh, like food. Uh, you will trust probably more the quality of a small producer of tomatoes that has a small production um, with, you know, it's the same with your, your veg. If you have less tomatoes on your plant, they will have more of everything and you can expect them to be much better than an enormous production. It's the same, uh, wine food are exactly the same. The difference we're making today is not new world, old world. It's about mass production and farming production. So it's the same with one. You just want to have less fruit. So they get more of everything, more light, more fruit from the ground, uh, more concentration. And uh, that's uh, how you can manage to do a uh, better wine. Giving uh, McDonald's ingredients to a Michelin star chef, I doubt he can do very much with it. Um, same with wine. So you have a mass production of wine and you have uh, agricultural farming production. And the, the, the reality for us is that every single wine we are making at Schlumberger 
and we do 22 different wines every year, except for Pinot Noir, they are all vinified the same way. There is no different, different, difference in vinification between Pinot Blanc and late harvest. So the vinification is not the key. The key is the terroir and the quality of your fruit. So with a uh, with Grand Cru, you expect to have um, all the elements from the ground. This is why you are looking at the lower productions. And uh, of course, more than half of our estate is under Grand Cru classification. So 55% of the Schlumberger estate is on Grand Cru, but we only make 20% of our production as Grand Cru. So this is, uh, we are, although we could uh, double uh, double and a half the production of Grand Cru, we are reducing it in order to have a higher quality in each of our Grand Cru's. Right. So, um, so basically, if you see uh, Domaine Schlambéger on the label, uh, you can trust that the quality is here, that is the style you expect. Um, the, the, the luxury of being family owned is that uh, if, we, if we, the vintage is not good enough, we're not making the wine. And to me, the luxury of a wine producer is not to drive a Ferrari or to own a chateau. Uh, it's to be able to skip a vintage if the quality is not there. And we had that situation uh, last time in 2016. Um, we didn't manage to have um, a good quality on the Riesling. The Riesling were very light. So instead of uh, bringing a light Riesling Grand Cru to our customers saying, you know, the vintage is a bit light this year, but that's how it is. We decided to skip the Riesling Grand Cru 16. So all of the Riesling Grand Cru went into the entry level called Prince Abbé. So 2016 Riesling Prince Abbé is to die for. It's a bargain. It's got all the Grand Cru in it. And in fact, it tastes a little bit young because of this uh, enormous addition of Grand Cru. But that's the guarantee we're taking to ensure the quality of a wine. And we can only do that because we're family owned. If you belong to a big financial group, uh, it's, it's a different story. Um, so that's the beauty of the Alsace region. Another thing about Alsace wines, I keep hearing there and then, oh, I don't know what to drink with Alsace. And we always talk about the complexity of Alsace. The main responsibility to that is comes from the growers themselves. Uh, Alsatian growers love talking about the complexity of their wines. Yes, Alsace is complex. But what we forgot to mention is how easy Alsace can be. Uh, half of our ranch are extremely easy wine to pour and to drink. Uh, the wine I call the easy player are uh, Pinot Blanc, Sylvaner, Muscat, Old Riesling, Classic or Grand Cru, and Classic Pinot Gris. This range of wines are dry wine made for food that you can pour pretty much anytime in any occasion. The complexity really to me starts with the Pinot Gris Grand Cru, Givers Grand Cru, that are very aromatic, have more sugar. So yes, those ones are more uh, on special occasion and for specific focus. In fact, I've managed to taste quite a few wines in the world and I never found anything similar to a Pinot Gris Grand Cru. For me, those wines are the signature of the Alsace region and you really don't find this anywhere else. But all of the dry wine are very easy wine to pour. Um, I've got here a magnum, look at this beautiful bottle, of a Riesling Grand Cru. Now, Riesling is a wine whenever you need a dry wine for food, you can pour Riesling. You don't question yourself when you open a Sancerre, a Chablis, uh, if the food is appropriate. You know that the wine will heat the food. While in Alsace, you have the exact, that exact same uh, attitude with Riesling. You know you can pour Riesling in any occasion where you have food. Severine, would it be right to say that your Riesling is dry? Not, not all Alsace Riesling is, is dry, is it? Um, they are becoming more and more dry. Um, we have been through a, a tragic wave to our point of view. For us, as Alsace growers, 
Riesling must be dry. It's not an a choice. It must be dry. If you want to do sweet wine, you can do it with Gewurz. The reason why some producer um, went to a little bit sweeter Rieslings where they, they saw uh, German Riesling were selling extremely well, so they decided to go that direction. Um, it's going backwards today. More and more Riesling are dry. In fact, we have a new... Uh, low that came last year when your wine are um, less than six grams sugar you can put dry on the front label and of course everybody wants to put dry uh, with Riesling so it's going to force producer to do Riesling with less than six grams sugar mm-hmm. having said that it's true uh, that it's becoming really challenging to grow Riesling in the last few years with the global warming uh, the lack of acidity uh, has been a real challenge to grow Riesling. We were struggling in 16, where well, we didn't do a Grand Cru. We were struggling in 18, but we finally managed to make proper uh, Riesling Grand Cru. So growing that grape in, uh, in Asia is becoming, is becoming a challenge. Um, you don't want to bring grape too early. It's green, green grapes. Um, so to get that maturity in Riesling, because it's a late grape that come to maturity more normally more end of September or October. So it's becoming a challenge and you don't want to hire your alcohol too much. So yes, it's becoming um, challenging to grow Rieslings and I'm hoping to see more and more uh, dry Riesling on the region. But again, when you know the producer, you know that uh, at Schlumberger we never grow Riesling that are more than five grams sugar. It doesn't exist. And as I mentioned, you have that line on the back of each bottle to chat. And we are very, very uh, honest with that. We don't give a professional perception. Uh, a lot of professional journalists say a Gewürz Classic is off dry. No, it's sweet. For most consumers, it tastes sweet. So we're going to put sweet on the back label. Another grape that I really love is Pinot Gris. So... I'm going to f- um, explain to you the different grape of Alsace on the, what I, to me is an easy way to remember them. The Riesling is a grape that can be compared to an apple. You have an apple one week in your kitchen. No matter when you eat your apple, it always has acidity. So the acidity of Riesling makes it dry. Pinot Gris is a fruit that reacts like a peach. When you buy your peach on Monday, it's hard and firm. As the days go, it gets softer and sweeter. Now, the Pinot Gris Prince Abbé is a peach that you will have at the beginning of the, the week. It's a grape that is picked earlier, so it's still dry enough. So it has fruit, but a very strong acidity and minerality to keep it fresh. The Pinot Gris Grand Cru is more peach from Friday or Saturday that has gained in sugar. So it's more uh, soft and sweeter. And the Gewürz is more like an exotic fruit. Very fragile to grow, uh, extremely aromatic explosion of flavors. So if we have a line in a range, basically, you will have after the Pinot Gris Classic, which is still considered as dry, you will move to Pinot Gris Grand Cru and all the Gewürz category that are much sweeter. And then we come to the extreme of Alsace, which she's called late harvest or Selection de Grenoble, which are the dessert wine, the very licorice uh, sweet wines, which still have a very strong minerality to keep it drinkable. It's not full of sugar and that's it. It has a very strong balance. Uh, Olivier Ombrecht in the region will tell you uh, you need three ingredients to make Alsace wine. It's balance, balance, balance. And this is also why it's a unique region in the world, because growing so many different fruits and to have the right balance between the sugar and the acidity, it's a real challenge. It's not something like growing too red or too white. It's um, it's quite challenging and it requires skills. Um, So that's the beauty, basically, of uh, of Alsace range. So honestly, you can go with confidence on Alsace. Do not be afraid. Uh, there is definitely another swine set you're going to like. Um, 
and uh, it's really um, they, they are made to go with food so it's really a strong recommendation when it comes to dinner in restaurants or um, or a nice dinner with friends uh, the other uh, the last maybe a munch I can do with that is um, they are what I like to call fabulous pleasure for money I don't like to call value for money but uh, what we are facing today is quite challenging and they are very good um, placed when it comes to pleasure for money. So they are still reasonable. Uh, Schlumberger is also uh, among the most reasonable estates. It's uh, on purpose. Uh, my brother and I are in our 40s. We have kids. We know that wine is not always um, the number one priority when it comes to budget. So our aim is that everyone can find a Schlumberger wine uh, that they can enjoy without breaking their arms in terms of cost. So, and we really hope that we're going to keep, uh, keep going this way. What I can guarantee is the trust that uh, is behind every bottle. Our aim to be uh, at the, the top of the top when it comes to quality, service. We are very lucky. We have a, an amazing team behind us uh, uh, could i just ask you a little bit about that sure. team and you you in the um in your vineyard in your uh, cellars i should say um you you explained a little bit about the different grape varieties but of course in the cellars do you use a different uh, method for winemaking or uh, what is the form i mean you know we hear a lot about people using different types of container for fermentation mm. and this sort of thing you have a, a tradition in your family to always use the same uh, methods for winemaking? Yes, we have been uh, for 200 years pretty much using the same. Uh, basically, Schlumberger is about being between tradition and modernity. So we've been using modernity tools where it's convenient, but all our wines, absolutely all of them, are fermenting in oak cask. Those are, those are enormous barrels. Uh, that are we have a, a, a cask between 800 liters and 17,000 liters and all kind of sizes in between so all the wines uh, are fermenting into those oak cask those casks are more than 100 years old because we don't want any oak taste in our wines uh, we feel that as as wines are too aromatic to handle a uh, strong oak so those casks don't have any oak uh, taste left. Um, after fermentation, the wine stays on fine leaves in this Oscar or cask for six to eight months. So literally today in July, we've been moving, June, July, we've been moving all the 19 vintage from the oak cask to stainless steel tanks for storage. So the wine is totally finished. They are moved to a stainless steel tanks um, and they're going to stay there uh, one year for the Prince Abbey range, one year and a half to two years for Grand Cru. So every single step, uh, we take an enormous lot of time before moving the wine. Remember, there was one thing that wine hates all his life is to be moved. Um, if you ask me, I've got an old vintage, is, is it still good? My first question is going to be, how many times did you move? The, so each time we have to move the wine to a new container, we leave it there for enough time to stay still and rest. Uh, so it's not a fast production. You will not see the 19 vintage of Flamberger on the shelf. Uh, but it's the same again with food. If you spend time to cook with good ingredients, you can put the leftover in your fridge and you can warm them up three days later. So it's the same. The more time you take in the process, the longer aging potential your wine is going to have. And to me, I'm absolutely 300% convinced that the aging potential mainly, mainly comes from the way the wine has been made. If you spend enough time in each process of winemaking, if you do it extremely fast, like if within two or three months, your wine is bottled, it doesn't mean the wine is bad. It means it's going to have to be drank fast because it's been made really fast. So yes, in that way we are very, uh, we are very traditional in winemaking. And as I say, um, same between Pinot Blanc and Cuvée Christine, they all have the same treatment. And we yeah. only interfere 
on specific cask when it's needed. We also have the capacity because we have so many different oak casks to follow each plot. So like every single plot of Grand Cru is vinified separately and we blind taste them at the end and we decide what deserve to be Grand Cru to our standard and what shouldn't. And this is why only 20% of the total of Grand Cru we are bringing in finished as a, in a Grand Cru bottle. And so thinking about these uh, different Grand Cru, um, I know if you look at your, your nice map of the, of the vineyard, it shows the Kitele uh, faces, I think, south and, uh, and a little bit uh, towards the west as it goes round that hill, and then the, the Serian Casa, a little bit more southeast, is that right? And that's so absolutely you, right. So do, you, so do you get the sun is sort of trapped in some places? Um, yes, so I'm the, thinking particularly the difference, for example, between uh, the wines from Kessla and the wines from Kitele, uh, which are actually from uh, vineyards facing in slightly different directions, aren't they? Absolutely. So the sun starts here in the morning on the southeast exposure. Uh, it turns around, but midday is about full south at the peak of the Kitele, and in the afternoon is here on the southwest. So, for example, we know that the Pinot Gris prefer the afternoon sun. So this is Kitele, but here you have all the Pinot Gris plant, Pinsabe planted because we know it's a grape that prefer the afternoon sun. On the top of this mountain, we've just replanted some Pinot Blanc. The Pinot family enjoy afternoon sun. So why would you, sorry, sorry, why would you, why would you plant Pinot Blanc on top of the hill? Because uh, the Pinot uh, grape like the afternoon sun, so this is okay. a southwest exposure. No, sorry, it's, I meant uh, you, put, you said you planted Pinot Blanc at the top. We have Pinot Gris, Pinot Gris yeah. at the bottom yeah. and yeah. Pinot Blanc at the top. Okay, okay. And so then, a little bit cooler there, but. Absolutely. And yeah. then you have Givers, which prefer the morning sun. So the Givers time in there. And this is why uh, the, the late harvests are made in two specific plots in the hearse of the Kessler with the southeast exposure, because it's an ideal exposure for Givers time And the Riesling is going to be planted at the bottom of the forest. You have a forest up here. So all along, you, the Riesling is going to be planted because what can happen um, in September, October, you can have some sort of um, uh, autumn frost, uh, fog, fog that comes out of the mountain and it's going to jump in the valley and it avoids the Rieslings. This is why the Riesling will be more at, mm -hmm. underneath the forest. Uh, you also have Riesling in the, in the serring. But um, we basically manage to find the best grape depending on the best location and that's also because we are the the luxury of having three sun exposure most of alsace vineyard this is colmar direction so 90 percent of alsace vineyard is planted on a southeast exposure but we are here in the valley so and, and yeah, also we, looking at the map uh, severine um, I think, is it right that the, the soils do vary? So, for example, between Kessler and Kitele, you have a different aspect. Yeah. But between Sering and Kitele, or Sering and Kessler, I think the soil is a little bit different, is it? Yeah. Kessler and Spiegel are 100% sandy soil. Mm -hmm. Sering is sandy with limestone. This is why we only make Riesling in the Sering, because um, uh, limestone is very convenient for Riesling. <laughs> We remember, Mark, we did a Givers Traminer Grand Cru Serring in 2000 vintage and uh, it wasn't a good success, so we stopped doing it. So <laughs> uh, we do only make Riesling and we also replanted Pinot Noir in the Serring because uh, Pinot Noir is a grape that really uh, loves limestone soil. And the Kitele has volcanic rock. This is why Kitele is what I call my teenager. You know, I often um, compare my four Grand Cru to four children. It's like you have four children, uh, same education, born in the same family, same values, but different personality. And all of us can understand what different personality means to children. You can have, you just don't, don't understand how, how different they can be being in the same family. And a job at Chambergé is to highlight this personality into your glass. 
is to give uh, each of them um, the chances to express their their own personality and their own characteristic with the same value of being well behaved once they are in bottom and so on. And if I have a teenager who takes longer to grow, it's definitely the Kitelli. Uh, we are at the moment on Riesling Kitelli 17, and I'm afraid to say that it's very young. It's totally drinkable, most people love it, but uh, Kitelli is a concrete that is absolutely to die for with eight to 10 years of age. So it takes longer to come to its perfect potential. Once it does, it's probably better than all the others. So, oh. so approximately what age would you say you would like to drink uh, a Kitelé? For example, a uh, Kitelé Riesling, which is eight. a steely mineral style of Riesling. Yeah, it's eight, ten years for me. Really? Yeah. It's, my, it's when I enjoy it the most. Uh, it's all about patience, you know, so um, it's not a... I know that the world is requiring to go faster and faster, but that's something that's not going to happen with Schlumberger. It's one step at a time, like a horse is when they work on the vineyard, they just go one, one step at a time. That's uh, the key uh, to quality. The, when you mentioned horses just then, uh, some people listening may not know that your vineyard is, it, it, they know it's steep, you have explained that, but it is so steep that you cannot get a tractor on many places, I believe. And you Absolutely. use horses. Yeah, we use horses, so not to harvest, as people uh, often think. We use horses on the top of the vineyard to work the soil, to return and uh, aerate the soil. And uh, we, not everyone has an horse in his vineyard, so it's not as fashionable, but we actually never stopped at Schlumberger using horses. Uh, my great-grandfather had 32 horses, my dad had eight. We only have three left today. Um, to, honestly, yes, we use less and less horses compared to the past, but we never stopped using them on the, on the steepest part of the vineyard. And the breed we use are called Comtois, because they're among the few horses with Percheron who don't suffer from vertigo. And you, <laughs> you might think I'm joking, but honestly, I swear, you can only do this visit in the vineyard with me if you don't suffer from vertigo. And I had three times customers being stuck up in the vineyard because they had too much vertigo. I'm, I mean, Kate and Mark can uh, testify that it, it is very steep. So in fact, it's so steep that you have to have walls to hold it up in terraces, don't you? And I believe yes. the stone, the sandstone in those walls, that goes for miles, doesn't it? How long are the, are the walls holding up? It's, the, um, the... it's 35 miles of stone walls. It's basically my great-grandfather ID. Um, in the 1920s, the situation was we had 50 years of German annexion, uh, phylloxera, and World War I. So there were no men left to cultivate the vineyard. So all the ladies and family went to my great-grandfather, who was a health, wealthy guy in the city, says, Mr. Schlumberger, can you buy a plot? And I don't believe we had a farmer as much as my great-grandfather was. It was a, really a man from the ground, from the land. So he realized that if I don't do anything, this mountain is going to disappear. So that's how he extended the vineyard from 40 to 140 hectares. And as he had to replant everything, he replanted everything in terraces because it's a, it's a sandy soil. So imagine planting vine on the dune uh, by the beach. It's the exact same. So the, it fell constantly. So the terraces are keeping the soils up. And uh, those terraces are made of stone walls, exactly like um, the same way the Roman used to make it, because you cannot put concrete, you need the water to run through the terraces. And we currently have two masons uh, remaking walls all year long. Uh, that's also part of the art and of the value of a company like ours. We, it's, it's really, a, we are probably doing 15 different jobs in one company, and that's the, the magic of it. It might, yeah, that must be relatively unusual to have a, a vineyard where you have to have two full-time stonemasons. Uh, and I'm very, very proud. It's a remarkable thought to add but to I'm the very, cost. Of we, are we are extremely proud to be able to maintain 
this uh, lifestyle and this production style uh, in 2020. It's, uh, and I just keep hoping we will be able to do it uh, on and on again. Uh, because today you believe, it's like your kids bringing that new song that has been playing on for 30 years. I mean, you believe that new tools are gonna help you and then 20 years later, people are going backwards. Uh, at Trambege, we, we move to modernity, but slowly, where it's really needed. Uh, we really enjoy and uh, pre preserve this tradition style of winemaking because um, it has made its proof for 200 years. So no, no really a question about changing that. And your family, of course, having had the vineyards now for 200 years, 200 plus years, um, I, I'm sure that you're looking long-term for everything. And I was thinking particularly about your system of viticulture and sustainability. This is obviously uh, very fashionable, very important for everybody to think about that. Is that part of your philosophy as well? Yes, 100%. Um, literally in this job, what uh, my brother and I, we benefit from our parents' job for 30, 40 years. Whatever we are doing today is for our children. It's, it's you, you only work that way from you benefit from the next generation and you work for the next one. So you can never really decide that, okay, we're fine, we've finished, we're done. Our, our priority today is to move to organic. Of course, to be organic, of, most of the vineyard is under organic uh, production. Uh, but to be organic, uh, to have the certification, you must have 100% of your estate under um, organic production. We are not at 100% yet. Uh, the reason is only technical, is uh, there is few machines that you need um, to be organic, um, and those machines don't work on slopes. So it's really only a technical reason that we cannot be organic. But, um, so we are moving uh, and working hard going to that direction, but to be honest, I think this organic appellation is a fabulous, fabulous thing to force, uh, especially the food industry, to stop poisoning us, which they have done for 40 years. Uh, all those big chemical groups uh, when they're making food. Um, so hopefully we will win that one. Uh, but at Chambage, we have been using something else for 200 years that is very similar for me to organic. It's called the farmer common sense. Um, that has been in the company for 20 years and it's if you look at the organic uh, request the farming common sense is the exact same and I think uh, people have just lost uh, this common sense uh, in terms of whatever we produce we produce stupid things every day uh, that has no sense um, we are very much into farming here into traditional farming so that's something that is very, very, uh, of course, important to us. That's great to hear. So, Serene, um, the another question we've been asked is about the uh, the harvest this year, um, and uh, we are now. I mean, in England, looking from across the Channel, uh, we've had uh, we started the summer quite hot, uh, and we're expecting some warm weather in the coming weeks in England. But um, what has been happening with you? Did you have a warm spring? Did the flowering go well? What's the weather like now? So right now we are in a very much uh, classic uh, summertime. We are, uh, it's very dry. We have 30, 32 degrees every day. Uh, lack of water, but that become, I'm afraid to say classical. Um, we had um, all the containment, like Mar February, March, April were extremely dry and sunny. Uh, and the, the, the wet weather more mainly came in end of May, June. So we had a bit of wet days. So it's kind of mixed. Like normally you should have wet weather in February, March, it was changed. Um, I have to say that up to today, um, the, the, the crop looks absolutely amazing. Uh, the, the grapes uh, looks really in good condition uh, and they look fantastic. Um, so, I'm often, uh, I've seen through history that when you are facing a difficult time, that's often when you have the best vintage ever as oh. a reward. Something to look so, forward to then. 
<laughs> let's see. Having said that, um, I never talk about a vintage unless it's in the town. Like I can start talking about the 20 vintage probably in December when the wine, most of the wines are cemented. Because I have seen two vintages uh, being totally re reversed a day before the harvest. 2006, uh, the 15th of September, the crop looked amazing. The 16th of September, we had a big, big rain, 20 degrees outside, and we went to, to uh, uh, pourriture, uh, uh, rot. Rot. No. rot. Uh, and we had to run around the clock and we had to bring everything in two weeks. And the, the, the crop was totally ruined. Uh, 17 was the opposite. It, it rained, we said it only rained once in Alsace from May to September. <laughs> and then September, suddenly the Indian summer came and the crop was totally saved and it's an amazing vintage. So unless it's fermenting, I'm not talking about the vintage, but so far so good. But with the, um, the weather you're having at the moment, I imagine that the progress of the grapes in terms of ripening uh, must be quite forward. And I know that uh, in many parts of, of, of Europe, the harvest has been earlier and earlier in the last maybe 20 years it's gradually becoming earlier is it the same situation in Alsace that you're having earlier harvest now absolutely uh, totally true uh, for the third time in our history we're gonna start between the 20th and the 25th of uh, August what, uh, this year is, to pick the grapes yes yeah which is right. uh, to give you an idea this is pretty much a month earlier that uh, when my dad was picking in the 80s, 90s. So within uh, 20 years, uh, 15, 25 years, we've gained a, a month. It's a month earlier. Lately, when, it was okay, when the harvest was pretty normal, we would start around the 10th of September. But this year, it's going to be end of August. So yes, it's earlier and earlier. And then it's weird because it can be very early and then you can have a break of two weeks before bringing your Grand Cru. So it really goes, it's really going to depend on the weather in September. And what about the different grape varieties? Do you pick them at different times? Yes. Uh, well, what has changed also in terms of picking is at my dad time, you knew more or less, okay, I bring my Pinot Blanc, I bring my Riesling today, then I bring my Pinot Gris. Uh, today, forget it. Uh, you can bring three different grapes the same day from different areas. So that's also what has uh, make the picking uh, more challenging uh, today than in the past, is that you really have to sometimes in the Pinot Gris, you're going to or uh, you're going to pick a plot in four different times to pick the right fruit at the right time. So um, yeah, it's more today. It's really there and then it's impossible to say what's going to come first in which order. Uh, so you, you always have a harvest plan that lasts for two days, and then you run. <laughs> and thinking that you have uh, 130 hectare to pick, uh, that you must need an army of pickers to you. How do you manage that? Uh, we take as many as we can, and as many as we can means as many as we, uh, depending on uh, the amount of truck that we have to carry people up. So we have a, a certain amount of van to bring people in the vineyard, and we fill them up with people. So we're looking at uh, 35 full-time people, and then extra 80 because more or less. Well, fantastic. Must be quite an organization. Well, uh, yeah, tell that to the vineyard manager. Is, is, I always tell him it's worse than a teacher starting school again. <laughs> <laughs> Severine, this has been such fun. It's been so nice to talk to you over in Alsace and to hear what is happening in uh, the Schlumberger vineyards this year. It's been a pleasure. If you look for a, a spot for your vacation, we are fully open. EasyJet flights are working again to Bas Basel and Mulhouse. Uh, we yeah. have some wonderful ferme auberge and uh, in the, up in the Vosges mountain. So if you're looking at some green, relaxing uh, time, you have, um, you're more welcome in Alsace. I'll be here all summer. And uh, remember, drink Alsace and stay safe. <laughs> and I've got my uh, very special mask, I don't know if you can see, that says, drink Alsace. Perfect. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you all. I agree. So, Reen, on behalf of everybody, thank you very much indeed. Best of luck with your harvest this year. Thank you. And um, we hope to see you very soon. We hope to have the chance to come and visit you. And we hope also that you'll be able to come to England before the end of the year. Uh, I hope that so. That would be terrific. And to everybody who's been watching and listening, thank you very much for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon. And uh, goodbye, everybody. See you. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Severine.